So being in an accelerating space shed is the same as being pulled by gravity. Einstein called this the principle of equivalence. Einstein put the two ideas together and came up with an extraordinary conclusion. Acceleration bends space. Gravity and acceleration are equivalent. Therefore, gravity bends space. And this is Einstein's general theory of relativity. When it was published in 1916, the handful of people who understood it were amazed. But so far, it was just a theory. Einstein wanted proof. And for that, he needed a total eclipse of the sun. of relativity says gravity is curved space. To show me how curved space affects light, Peter Coles, an astrophysicist, has brought along a trampoline. This two-dimensional grid represents the universe defined by Isaac Newton, where time and distance are always regular. When Einstein came along, he messed it all up. So we now have the sun in place. Mm -hmm. See, the sun's a very massive body, so it exerts a very strong gravitational effect on space and time. Yeah. And you see that represented here, by the way. The grid is now deformed. It's curved, especially near the sun. And mm -hmm. one of the consequences of that is that light rays, which in the absence of the sun were straight lines, mm -hmm. are no longer straight lines. And you can see that if you actually try to send a light signal past the sun with your golf ball there. Great. So if Einstein's right, light from a star follows the curve in space-time when it passes close to the sun on its way to the Earth. But because we assume light travels in a straight line, from our point of view on Earth, the star looks to be further away from the sun in position B. If he's wrong and gravity doesn't bend light, the star will stay in position A, even when the sun is there. Of course, normally you can't see a star near the sun because it's too bright. But there is one time when you can see the star, during a total eclipse of the sun. Einstein predicted the shift of the star with the complex maths of general relativity. What he needed next was someone to take a photograph of it during an eclipse. That man was Arthur Eddington, a respected British astronomer. He was entranced by Einstein's theory and was desperate to prove him right. So in May 1919, he put together a team and set sail for the African island of Principe. I've come to Alderney in the Channel Islands for a prime view of an eclipse so that I can repeat this historic experiment. This tiny island is stuffed full of enthusiasts, TV crews, professional astronomers, bulging with the latest gadgets. They're here to capture one of the most magical moments of nature, a total eclipse of the sun lasting one minute, 40 seconds. My state-of-the-art telescope is this. Well, it was in 1919. It's a smaller version of the kind Eddington used, and it belongs to veteran eclipse chaser Michael Maunder, who is showing me how to take a photo using something called the Mexican hat trick. In order to get an accurate time of about one second, the easy way is to say 1,000. And when it's all ready to make the exposure, 1,000. Simple <laughs> as that. Yeah, very good. It's roughly an hour to go now before the eclipse. Big black clouds now. Occasionally we see a little glimpse of the sun. It's like everything is kind of funneled down to just this one 
little moment, well, I don't know, one minute, 40 seconds that the Lord might give us to get as many shots as possible. There's not much hope of seeing any stars through all this cloud. But the weather was even worse 80 years ago. The major problem that they had in Principe was almost catastrophic. Uh, on the morning of the eclipse, it was completely overcast. There was a torrential thunderstorm. And it looked like they weren't going to be able to get any data at all. Back in Berlin, Einstein was waiting with bated breath. And it's four minutes, something like that, to go. OK. I'm already here. The eclipse in Principe actually happened in the early afternoon. And by that time, the thunderstorm had gone and the clouds were starting to break up. It's getting very dark now. Just must be a few seconds now away from totality. Right, OK. Let's take it. First one, the moving the plate. Oh, 1,000. Plate out. Second exposure. 1,000. Well, I managed to take two photographic plates. Eddington didn't do much better. Out of all the plates that they took, there were only five that were usable. And because of the high cloud, many of the stars which they would have been able to see in better conditions were not visible. So most of the plates only had two or three stars with measurable positions on them. Back in Cambridge, Eddington's next step was to compare his eclipse photographs with a reference plate. This plate was taken of the same star a few months earlier when its light would not have been affected by the sun's gravity. It's actually very small. He then carefully compared the star's position on the two plates. This is enlarged. Then. This is enlarged about 50 to 100 times on this screen here. So we can see quite a big image of the star. So we're placing uh, one of the plates that Eddington took before the eclipse with the star field on it. And we're going to very carefully center the star under the crosswires here. And now we can take this plate out and replace it with the plate that Eddington took during the eclipse. And of course, if Einstein is right, the star will no longer be on the crosswires. And if we do this very carefully, you can see that, in fact, the star is not on the crosswires. And that tiny movement made all the difference? It certainly did. scientific community eagerly awaited Eddington's results. November the 6th, 1919, a joint meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Royal Society of London, atmosphere here described as being that of a Greek drama. Were folk here's very fundamental views going to be altered tonight? What were the results of Eddington's experiments? A deflection of light takes place of the amount demanded by Einstein's generalized theory of relativity. Excitement, pandemonium. Ludwig Silberstein jumps to his feet, points to the portrait of Sir Isaac Newton, says, gentlemen, we owe it to that great man to proceed very carefully before we start retouching or modifying his law of gravitation. Sir Oliver Lodge walks out and then Chairman J.J. Thompson says, he is confident that the Einstein theory must now be reckoned with and that our conceptions of the fabric of the universe must be fundamentally altered. Crowd swayed. Einstein, hero.
Overnight, Einstein became a superstar. The war had just ended, and the public, tired of endless stories of misery and devastation, embraced this archetypal image of a gentle, absent-minded professor. Thousands of articles struggled to explain his theory. Housewives were now discussing time dilation and space travel. Relativity was the new buzzword. Einstein was propelled to the status of a Hollywood icon. Einstein became a sensation. Charlie Chaplin actually put it well. Charlie Chaplin described the fact that people cheered him because everybody understood him, and they cheered Einstein because nobody understood him. The general theory of relativity overturned our traditional view of space and time and helped us understand such cosmic phenomena as black holes and the Big Bang. Einstein single-handedly created the first new model of the universe since Sir Isaac Newton over 250 years earlier. Einstein took the principle of relativity and said, well, if this is right, then these are the consequences. We have to abandon these pictures. And he had the courage, the intellectual courage and the imagination to follow through to the consequences of those. And for me, it's one of the great intellectual achievements ever. The groundbreaking discovery